Well, good afternoon, and um, thank you all for coming out in the snow. And thank you, Elise, for that um, very kind um, introduction. I always kind of feel like I want to duck under my chair when we're going through all of that because, um, first and foremost, I'm a mom. And, I, and this is passion work for me, as I know it is for many of you. Um, and, and all that we're doing matters so, so much to so, so many. So thank you all for everything that you do. Um, I am very honored to be here this week as you um, close out the week of celebrations and honoring um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy. And I welcome the opportunity to reflect on the hopes and the aspirations and expectations and needs of people with disabilities in the context of um, Dr. King's message from 1963 when he spoke to this country about his dream of the day when we are all judged by the content of our character. Um, while a lot of great strides, many great strides, have been made in the establishment of civil rights protections for people with disabilities across the nation, Dr. King's concept of living in beloved community with justice and dignity for all continues to be an unattained dream for many people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I thought I'd start first with a little historical context um, regarding public policy. I know that um, many of you may know this, and to those of you who do, I apologize, but I think it's important to remember where we've come from. Um, this past year has really been um, a banner year in celebrating milestones in disability policy um, and the establishment of civil rights protections for people with disabilities. Um, vocational rehabilitation, which has helped to improve employment outcomes for people with disabilities, was established 90 years ago. The predecessor to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, formerly called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, became law 35 years ago ensuring that children with disabilities would have access to a free, appropriate public education. Ten years ago, Congress updated the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, commonly known as No Child Left Behind, although we don't call it that anymore, with provisions that ensure that children with disabilities not only would have access to education, but would also be expected to achieve and, and um, access academic success. With, la with a lot of fanfare, last summer we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, our core civil rights law, at which President Obama remarked on his vision for our country, and I quote, to look out for one another, to advance opportunity and prosperity for all of our people, to constantly expand the meaning of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, to move America forward. That is what we did with the ADA. The Americans with Disabilities Act set forth our goals for people with disabilities. Equality of opportunity, full participation, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. And in a little less known statute, but important to all of us here in this room, nearly 50 years ago, the first version of what was to become the DD Act, the Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act, passed Congress acknowledging the unique needs of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Yet even with all of these efforts and the cultural shifts that we have made in truly believing that people with disabilities can participate fully in our schools, our communities, our places of employment, and our economy, today I share some sobering statistics with you. People with disabilities in this country are three times more likely than others to live at or below the poverty line. Half of all working age adults who experience po poverty each year have a disability. Families supporting individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities across a lifespan, both children and adults, experience high far, excuse me, far higher rates of economic hardship than other families. The percentage of students with disabilities who complete high school with a diploma hovers around 70%, and in over a dozen states, including Tennessee, that statistic is closer to 50% or less. People with disabilities are less likely to attend college than people without disabilities. Less than 10% of people with disabilities own their own homes, as compared to 70% of Americans without disabilities. 
50% of individuals with disabilities do not have a bank account. The current workforce participation rate for people with disabilities is only 27% as compared to 73% of working age adults without disabilities. So those are some pretty devastating numbers. It becomes hard to see how we achieve the goal of full participation in our communities as valued contributors when we are still struggling with these issues. While the successes in disability focused legislation are absolutely the foundation of disability policy, both in terms of civil rights and program investments, I believe that effective disability policy gains are often also achieved by planting small seeds of inclusive approaches and I apologize, my pages are out of order, <laughs> and high expectations in our generic system. So I was like, that doesn't sound right. Um, and so that we can see programs and policies grow. Um, not unlike a garden, these seeds take time, energy, and attention to get to outcomes. The law is just the beginning, because so much of the meaningful policy is made in the interpretation and in the implementation. For example, one of the first pieces of legislation I worked on when I came to Washington, D.C. was the reauthorization of the Head Start Act. Now, some of you may know this, but many of you may not. Head Start was actually one of the first pieces of federal legislation that addressed the needs of children with disabilities. It has had a long-standing provision since the late 1960s that requires programs, Head Start programs to prioritize children with disabilities and developmental delays and to include a minimum population of 10 percent. When we started looking at the program information related to Head Start, based on a few concerns that were raised, it became clear that this requirement had not been expected of the Head Start grantees. Monitoring and enforcement had been minimal. Um, Health and Human Services' own data demonstrated that many of the programs were out of compliance. Not enough kids with disabilities were participating in Head Start. And we had become complacent. And when I say we, I mean the disability community writ large. We had gotten this into federal law and then ignored it. In the reauthorization, these requirements were strengthened, realigned, and explicitly supported. Through the regulatory process and updated data, we're now showing improvements again in the numbers of children with disabilities participating in Head Start. That seed of inclusion and early childhood coordination in this particular instance is growing again because we circled back on the policy. Today I'm going to talk to you about five significant areas of federal disability policy. Education, employment, economic empowerment, health care, and community living. Each are issues that in one way or another are fundamentally shifting in the law, implementation, regulation, or practice. That I'd start with education. When I was born, and looks like for many of you in the room, this would probably uh, also be somewhat true, um, students with intellectual and developmental disabilities did not have access to, to public K-12 education, let alone college. I know we have some wonderful college students here in the room from the Next Step program, and that was unthinkable not very long ago. Many people with intellectual and developmental disabilities languished in state institutions where their basic needs were barely met. Learning was rarely a priority. Formal education was practically unheard of. Public resources were simply not available to support children with significant disabilities to live at home and to receive an education in our local schools. Many parents were educating children with intellectual disabilities in makeshift church basement classrooms, but they wanted to send their kids to school. When Congress passed the Education for All Handicapped Children Act in 1975, our country finally said that it was no longer acceptable for children with disabilities to be denied the opportunity to learn and, our, and to succeed in school. Eventually, this law became IDEA, establishing the right for millions of children with disabilities to attend schools with their brothers and sisters, neighbors and friends, and guaranteeing these children a, a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. In the 35 years since the law has passed, students with intellectual and developmental disabilities have made major strides. 
Each year in this country, 60, over 16,000 students with intellectual disabilities earn a high school diploma, a regular high school diploma, and thousands more earn other completion certificates. IDEA has made a tremendous difference for students with disabilities and students like my high school age daughter, yet there is still so much more that needs to be done. Students with disabilities need to have the opportunity to be held to high expectations in our elementary and secondary schools. They should be able to access effective general education teachers who, who understand that to teach in today's schools means to teach all diverse learners, including students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Students need teachers coming out of our colleges of education ready to teach all students. Students need access to special education supports and services that are designed to help them succeed in the general education curriculum, not, se special, not separate tracks, not special curricula, and not segregated classrooms. They need access to differentiated and appropriate instruction and to the grade level content. Students with intellectual and developmental disabilities can be and should be held to these high standards and given the opportunity to achieve. They need to build social capital inter and interdependent relationships in which they both receive and give support to others, often in the educational context. They need to be full participants in our educational communities, on our sports teams, in our extracurricular clubs, volunteering and service learning, and on the honor roll. And we, need, we should be encouraging students with disabilities to become lifelong learners pursuing their post-secondary education goals, finding gainful, competitive, integrated employment in jobs that they like, earning a living wage. Students with intellectual and developmental disabilities need to be supported so that the rights that they are afforded under the ADA are not only protected, but fully implemented, and so that the goals of the law, equality of opportunity, independent living, full participation, and economic self-sufficiency, before, before we're done here, you're all gonna be able to say those four things by heart, are fully realized for each person with a disability. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act, love it or hate it, has also played a critical role in the past decade in raising expectations for students with disabilities. While IDEA ensures a place in the classroom, ESEA, ensures a focus on access to the general curriculum, to achievement, and to real learning, and meaningful outcomes. It is time to better align these two laws and to insist that students with disabilities are general education students first and foremost. The role of special education must be that of pedagogy and support in order to access the general education content. The 2008 Higher Education Opportunity Act also took a significant step towards acknowledging that students with intellectual disabilities need and can benefit from access to higher education. For the first time, students with significant cognitive impairments and financial need will be able to access Pell Grants and other federal aid when they attend college with inclusive at inclusive comprehensive post-secondary transition supports designed to meet their academic and social needs. They will be able to continue to their academic instruction in college in programs such as Vanderbilt's Next Step where they belong with their non-disabled peers, other college students without disabilities. Congress intended that this new these new programs for students with intellectual disabilities that are established under the Higher Education Opportunity Act, receiving federal funds, would be inclusive best practices models where students with intellectual disabilities learn alongside their peers and are not in separate classrooms, separate buildings, and separate living spaces. This is not about creating special education on our college campuses. It is not about using students as research subjects for educators who are also learning. It is about ensuring that students have the chance to learn, to exercise self-determination, to develop job and living skills, and to earn meaningful credentials so that they can get jobs of their own, live in our communities, and strive towards economic self-sufficiency. We know that students with disabilities, including students who have been labeled as profoundly disabled, medically fragile, severely affected, benefit most when they are supported to pursue the same goals and aspirations that most of us have, to live where and how we choose, to have access to our community schools, and at all levels of education. 
We also know that people with intellectual disabilities are most likely to achieve these goals when they are pursued in inclusive environments with non-disabled peers. College is a time of learning, of all kinds of learning for all young people. It is not just about the academics. I'm sure the students in the room would agree with that. <laughs> students with intellectual and in developmental disabilities don't need college classes to learn how to do laundry. Ask any parent of a 20-year-old, and they will tell you about the universality of dirty laundry among college students. They need to figure it out in a laundromat just like everybody else. Students with intellectual disabilities don't need special classes to teach them how to keep their apartments clean. How many of you have been in the dorms lately? <laughs> they need to learn these life skills through real experience with real friends, just as all college students do. Students with intellectual disabilities don't need to be doing second grade math that the K-12 system worked on unsuccessfully for years in an institution of higher education. They need to be learning how to manage money, budget their resources, open a checking account, and handle their finances, just as most college freshmen need to learn to do. Students with intellectual and developmental disabilities don't need to be learning how to take notes with paper and pens in special classes on study skills. They need to learn how to use technology to access the concepts being presented at the level that, they are, that is appropriate to them, just as other college students are learning to do. And students with intellectual disabilities certainly do not need special safety rules, this has come up on a couple of the campuses, that diminish their independence as young adults. They need to be able to live and learn, take risks, make mistakes, just as all young people do on our college campuses. It is imperative that our new initiatives around students with intellectual and developmental disabilities attending post-secondary education not become another separate, segregated, special program where young adults with disabilities are treated as subjects and beneficiaries instead of affording them the respect they deserve as self-determined college students. I am glad to see entities like Vanderbilt working towards these goals. Education is about getting to employment. Unfortunately, the employment landscape for all workers is very difficult right now, and for people with disabilities, it is exceptionally bleak. As I mentioned before, only 20% of people with disabilities are participating in the workforce. According to the most recent community, American Community Survey, 32% of working age people with disabilities earned less than $5,000, and 35% of the non-institutional age population of people with disabilities live at or below 150% of the federal poverty level, as opposed to 19% of the general population. For people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, the challenges are even greater. When we look to the need for supports, states use Medicaid through the home and community-based waivers to provide the lion's share of employment support for people with IDDD. Only 22% of these individuals are receiving integrated employment services through Medicaid, while 74% are supported in sheltered employment, day habilitation services, or non-work community integration activities. Additionally, 8% of those in integrated employment are in group supported employment models, including enclaves and segregated work crews. Despite nearly 50 years of the legacy of the DD Act, 35 years of IDEA and 20 years of the ADA, cultural and attitudinal barriers still confront people with disabilities seeking employment. Low expectations are still the norm in our school systems, in our training programs, our workplaces, and sometimes even in our families. Recently, I had a DD Council staff person contact me with a very disturbing account of um, some transition staff who were speaking to them about conversations with parents and youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities in their state. And the staff found these conversations difficult and embarrassing because of the low expectations of the family members. These parents are not to blame. 
Often they have had experts telling them to manage their expectations and modify their dreams for years. In the context of overwhelmingly negative cultural attitudes and stereotypes about employment for opportunities for people with the most complex and support, support and communications needs. No wonder they're afraid. Yet, the youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities tell us something different. They're not interested in the old models. They don't want to attend school for 21 years only to sit in a segregated day program or to sit home and watch TV. They want to earn f money in jobs of their own save that, those resources and be able to have the power that goes along with having control over your financial resources. My friend Andy offers a great example of what is possible. Andy experiences cerebral palsy and significant intellectual disability, uses a power wheelchair and a communication device, and is a person who struggled to have the school systems believe that he could do anything, let alone work. When Andy was 18 years old, Despite having only two words, yes and no, Andy made it clear that he would like to work. It was a very long conversation to have his mother tell the story. Two days of yes and no. As a result, his mom pushed the high school to allow him to participate in school-based work experiences, helping in the library, despite dis significant attitudinal barriers from staff. Andy wanted to look for a job in the community. His family engaged in a person-centered planning process, put the ideas generated by the planning team into action. His team spoke to several employers, and the manager of a large independent bookseller saw the value in hiring Andy to scan and price books. Now remember, Andy has no use of most of his muscle system, with the exception of above the neck. Andy operates his computer with a head switch, and it interfaces with the bookstore computers. It's attached to a conveyor belt that moves the books along and is positioned, and, and they set it up so that the store's scanning machines are positioned so that Andy can independently operate this whole system with his head switch, scan and price the books, and enter them into inventory. Now, this is an individual who did not have the opportunity to graduate high school with a diploma and whose parents had been told that he certainly couldn't read, let alone handle a job of this magnitude. Andy started his job at this bookstore nine years ago and has been there ever since. He does his job 90% independently. He has an assistant who puts the stickers on the books and provides personal care. He makes a competitive wage. I haven't talked to him in a while, but last time I talked to him, I think he was up around $12 an hour. Has earned himself right out of SSI and onto SSDI. He's purchased his own accessible van, has terrific relationships with his coworkers, and most importantly, Andy loves his job. He is the embodiment of what is possible when we believe that anyone can work and when we have community support. According to the 2007-08 National Core Indicators data, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities working in facility-based work programs earned an av worked an average of 74 hours a month and earned for 74 hours a month an average of $101 in wages. That equates to $1.38 an hour. Individuals in competitive employment worked an average of 63 hours a month, 10 hours less yet earned an average of $422 a month, which computes to about $6.70 an hour. We must do more to ensure that all people with intellectual and developmental disabilities can work and can earn real wages. States vary widely to in the extent to which they support integrated employment. According to research done by the Institute for in Community Inclusion at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, the factors that influence integrated employment include several things. The approach of the state IDDD agencies. Most of these supports are provided by Medicaid. These agencies end up playing a critical role in determining the direction of the state and federal investment. High performing state agencies establish policies and practices that support improved employment outcomes based on the percentage of those served by the agency that participate in integrated employment. 
common sense. Another important factor is, is uh, community-based non-work. This is a category in Medicaid funding, and I apologize for those of you who don't want to walk down in the weeds, but this is important to know. Medicaid will pay for participation in activities that take place in the community that do not involve paid employment. And this is the grow biggest growing area of um, employment services in Medicaid. Um, it was established 15 years ago as an option. 38 states report um, services uh, indicating that 36% of the population is participating in these activities. This category of service has been a catch-all for day activities. This is the let's go to the zoo trip. There are currently limited data on the structure, activities, and outcomes, and states have not established clear service expectations or quality assurance strategies for this category of uh, Medicaid funding. Two other important components of getting to supported, and, excuse me, competitive supported integrated policy in states. Collaboration across systems. Collaborative initiatives between VR, IDD agencies, and the community are an important element in supporting employment outcomes. States that are most successful have taken a comprehensive and, and, and collaborative approach. Employment first policy in states like Washington can make measurable differences when the strategies, expectations, and measure, measured outcomes are built across systems, education, VR, home and community-based services, and the community employers themselves. Individual and family factors. We know that work means a lot more than money. And that integrated employment also provides expanded social relationships, heightened self-determination, and more opportunities for jo different job roles. Research has shown that families do want to consider community options for transitioning youth, but have concerns about long-term placement and stability, safety, and the social environment. We must redouble our efforts to provide families and youth with information about success stories, stories like my friend Andy. We must reassure them in order to foster this change. Employment is but one component of economic empowerment. Back in July, not long after I had started at ADD, we held a half-day conversation with leading disability organizations and federal agency staff to talk about economic self-sufficiency. And I was astounded by the number of myths, misunderstanding, and the lack of knowledge on, regarding one simple premise. It is possible to be a person with a significant disability who participates fully in education, goes to college, works in a real job making more than some minimum wage, saves their money, buys a house, and can still access supports and services such as healthcare and personal attendance services through public programs. That's not to say it's easy. The complexity of the systems make sure that, that it's not. But it's important that we understand that in order to, again, change the dynamic. One of the key pro pro problems related to savings and financial security for beneficiaries of Social Security disability benefits is the confusion about dis how disability programs treat income and resources for the purposes of program el eligibility. For example, saving has never been a problem for SSDI beneficiaries because these benefits are not based on economic need and there is no restriction on savings, investment, or asset accumulation. However, because there is a very common misperception in the disability community that this program is means tested, it is not uncommon to find SSDI beneficiaries disposing of their resources out of fear that retaining them will cause loss or reduction of benefits. SSI beneficiaries, however, do have significant barriers to asset ac accumulation. There are strict resource limits that have not been increased since the program's inception in 1974 blame Congress. In order to retain, it's a statutory change that has to be made, and it's a, it's a huge coster, and so the politics of getting it through are very, very difficult. In order to retain SSI eligibility, beneficiaries must not have countable resources in excess of $2,000 for an individual or $3,000 for an SSI eligible couple. However, 
there are numerous resources that are excluded from this limit that can be used to save. Many important SSA provisions allow accumulation of assets and provide work incentives. For example, regulations permit a beneficiary to own one home of any value as long as you're living in it. Business ownership is possible as well. The rules allow for unlimited accumulation of assets, including cash in a business account for the operation of a small business or microenterprise under the exclusion of property essential for self-support. The same is true for Medicaid eligibility because states cannot adopt Medicaid income and resource rules that are more stringent than SSI. Our fortunes are tied to these rules. Additionally, Social Security offers several resource exclusions to allow SSI beneficiaries to save or pay for post-secondary education. And plans for achieving self-support, past plans, are an opportunity for individuals with disabilities to accumulate income and or resources without causing either ineligibility in SSI or a reduction in benefit payments. There's no simple strategy or solution that will uh, overcome these barriers to, to advance greater self-sufficiency for persons with significant disabilities. But there are a lot of tools and strategies for building assets. I encourage you to learn more about this. Healthcare reform, the dominant agenda in the Department of Health and Human Services in which I work. ADD is one of the offices responsible for the work on the implementation of health care reform. In particular, our office has been working on long-term services and supports, including incredible improvements to Medicaid home and community-based waivers um, that I can't talk about yet, but they will be out soon, as well as uh, the Community Living Assistance Services and Supports Act, the CLASS Act, which creates a national voluntary insurance program that will provide benefits to working individuals with disabilities to purchase non-medical services and supports necessary to maintain independence. The Affordable Care Act has many, many moving parts. And there are so many good policy changes that will benefit and are already benefiting people with disabilities and their families. Over lunch today, someone asked, given the po political um, debate right now, what will happen if health care reform is repealed? It is currently the law of the land and we continue to implement it. And it is important to people with disabilities that we do so. For example, the law eliminates insurance company discrimination by prohibiting insurance companies from denying children coverage based on pre-existing conditions, which has already been implemented. And going forward, the act will prohibit insurance companies from denying coverage or charging more to any person based on their medical history, including gen genetic information. We've eliminated all lifetime limits on coverage and banned insurance companies from dropping people from coverage for utilization. Common sense. You have insurance, you should be able to use it. The act also restricts the use of annual limits in all new plans and existing employer plans until 2014 when the new law lifts all um, annual limits and they are prohibited. The new law will provide access to health insurance through the state exchanges to those without job-based coverage and provides premium tax credits to those who can't afford coverage, significantly increasing access to the choice of health insurance plans for individuals with disabilities. This will also enable people to get and keep their jobs rather than having to choose between health insurance coverage, i.e. Medicaid, and employment. In a little known provision, the Act also requires the development of ADA standards for accessible medical diagnostic equipment, things like examining tables, weight scales, and x-ray machines, so that people with disabilities can receive routine preventative care, such as mammograms and x-rays. There is a ton of information about health care reform um, at the Health and Human Services website, including state-based information. That website is healthcare.gov. It's pretty easy to remember. Um, and I would strongly encourage you to take a look at it. Um, additionally, um, the Administration on Developmental Disabilities recent newsletter provided a simple graphic representation of the various components of the implementation process of the Affordable Care Act, which is also available on our website. 
Another initiative that we've been involved in at Health and Human Services is community living. In these times of scarce resources, we have to be smart about our money and our expertise and combine forces if we're going to make a real difference. President Obama has charged the federal government with taking collaboration with, with across agencies very, very seriously. This time we intend to be sure that collaboration means more than joint signatures on official documents. It is intended to improve people's lives in visible, measurable ways in their communities and their neighborhoods. As such, the Community Ini Living Initiative was announced on the 10th anniversary of the Supreme Court's uh, Olmstead versus OC, excuse me, LC decision. As you know, Olmstead held that the unjustified isolation of people with disabilities is unlawful under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Since the ADA passed, people with disabilities have found it somewhat easier to get the services and accommodations they need, but clearly there is more that must be done. We are working with other, several fe other federal agencies, including the Department of Justice, Labor, Agriculture, Education, and Housing, to address the barriers to community living that people with disabilities and older Americans so frequently face. The Secretary of HHS charged the Office on Disability with convening an interdepartmental council to guide the work of the Community Living Initiative under Director Henry Claypool's leadership. As a member of the Coordinating Council, we are actively participating in this initiative. Over the course of the past year, the initiative has resulted in several important accomplishments and ongoing efforts. For example, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services released a community living letter to state Medicaid directors reaffirming the commitment to the policies identified in previous Olmstead letters and offering tools and information to help states make greater strides in achieving the promise of the Americans with Disabilities Act. HHS and HUD have announced two rounds of funding for vouchers with people, for people with disabilities to live in the community or transition out of institutional care with a second announcement made uh, within the last two weeks. HHS is using its network of state Medicaid agencies and local human service organizations to link eligible individuals and their families to local housing agencies. The Office on Disability awarded a contract to establish a Center of Excellence in Research on Disability Services, Care Coordination and Integration to, to create the data infrastructure to support the development of comparative effectiveness research on services and supports and quality models of care for persons with disabilities. Another critical community living um, activity under the Affordable Care Act relates to, we don't have a great name for this, it's called the Section 2402A <laughs> group, um, which is the section of the law to which it refers, um, that requires the Secretary to promulgate regulations regarding the oversight and assessment of home and community-based services across systems, not just Medicaid. Under 2402A, we hope to develop regulations to ensure that all states develop and support coordinated home and community-based service systems that allocate resources for services in a manner that is responsive to the changing needs and choices of the beneficiaries receiving home and community-based services, provide strategies for beneficiaries to maximize their independence, and provide individuals, their families, caregivers, or other representatives the support and coordination needed to design an individualized, self-directed, community-supported life. And this group has done a tremendous amount of work utilizing the work of this field around person-centered planning, self-determination, and self-directed supports in order to develop that work. Under this umbrella of community living, we are all looking at how we work across populations to bring the best elements of our, each of our systems together to ensure access, support, and person-centered thinking that should ensure choice and opportunity in public resources. The Administration on Aging, SAMHSA, and ADD are each learning a lot from another, our systems and our values, what is common and what is different, and how can we build comprehensive and coordinated approach, approaches out of the best of each system. The construct of community living has brought together various departments and organizations under operating under the values-based proposition that all people have the right to live self-determined lives in communities of their choosing. This core principle is consistent with the concept of beloved communities that Dr. King espoused. 
The engagement and supports of our neighbors, friends, family, and the broader community will ultimately be the factor that turns the tide on some of those grim, statistic, grim statistics I started with, not just the public policy research data and program implementation. So what do I mean? Let me tell you a story about community. And I apologize if any of you have heard the story. As a single mom many years ago, in a state that had little to no access to family or in-home support resource, resources, I often struggled to find the time to do the day-to-day -day tasks, like grocery shopping, going to the bathroom, running errands, mm -hmm. formal respite care, access to quality professional child care, targeted case management, or other support ser services were not something that was available to me. I managed to meet our day-to-day -day needs on the kindness of friends, neighbors, and some really great college students. When my younger daughters were three and four, I discovered this great little grocery store in our neighborhood. Some of you probably know what a Trader Joe's is. This store had important attributes, had consistent, cons consistent being a key word here, and friendly staff who were predictable in their shifts. It was a manageable size, and it had balloons. My daughter with an intellectual disability would come to the store with me, and after a few trips at age four, she had made friends with everyone in the store, and she had discovered the balloons. So we would go in. I would tie a balloon to her wrist on a really long string, and she would go. A little independence in the grocery store. I could do the shopping, get a little respite, kind of sad respite, but that's what we were at, the point that we were at at that, that, that stage, and let her loose. I could see where she was because of the balloon. I knew the staff in the store. I knew she could navigate this simple environment. I knew that her friends on the staff would help her stay safe and wouldn't let her head for the exit. I got an hour of shopping without a four-year-old. Any of you who are parents know <laughs> how important that is. And she got some freedom. So this went on for years. Our local Trader Joe's became a part of our community. And when we moved to DC from Oregon, um, one of my first tasks was to find the closest Trader Joe's and reestablish the relationships in a new store, complete with the balloons. Now the balloons become important because last year, after we had been there for a couple of years, she participated in a program called Odyssey of the Mind, which is a, some of you may know is an educational um, team middle school project. And she was the contributing member of the team who knew where to get 35 helium balloons for free <laughs> in order to float the object over the line 32 feet down the road, whatever the heck they had to do, who to call, had the relationship to get the balloons, knew how to get them, have them ready in the right colors, because of course this was a group of seventh grade girls and they had to be the right colors, for her, for her and her team. And it gave her the opportunity to contribute, to utilize social capital to get something done. And by the way, they used the balloons to win third place in the Odyssey of the Mind competition. And she did all of this independently. This, for a seventh grade student who had been labeled as a person with a significant disability. And now when she goes into the Trader Joe's, they got rid of the balloons, which is killing us. But she helps out while I shop. She gets people to try the samples. They are always able to give away a lot more on the days that she's there. She directs people to where things are in the store, and she offers to help bag the groceries, which is always to mixed effect. We see the Trader Joe's staff in our community. We run into them at the local food festival, at other community events, and all of that staff take the time to say hello to her, to ask her about school, to ask her about after school activities like Odyssey of the Mind, and find out what's new. The informal supports and relationships have provided a whole series of opportunities and social capital for Zoe. And hopefully that social capital will be something that ultimately helps her with opportunities related to an after school job, transition ideas, job coaching, or more. And when we need to bring those formal paid supports into her life and into ours, we will look to those relationships first, not just, part, not just formal providers, to be part of the solution. 
While the local grocery store is certainly not supports and services in the traditional sense, the, sense, the point of my story is this. The skills to see the value in these kinds of relationships and community and to develop social capital are key to the concept of community living. How many of you have never landed a job or another opportunity because of a community relationship? All of us find work, meaningful relationships through community. In mentoring and supporting families and self-advocates, it can only be partially about the services. It needs to be, in large part, about community and reciprocity. How do we help families and people who are often isolated and struggling to take care of the tasks that others take for granted? Going to the grocery store, going to the bathroom in peace. To develop and nurture those relationships in community. How do, we people, how do we help people connect the dots and, and understand that the path to competitive, integrated employment is as dependent upon community relationships as it is upon education and skills? As we continue the policy debate about services and supports in an era of shrinking resources, reliance on Medicaid, diversity of cultures, and increasing need, how does community fit in? We will continue to struggle to close the sheltered workshops, eliminate segregated classrooms, and get rid of institutions if we cannot engage the broader community, and unless we hold ourselves to the high expectations we espouse. We need to move the DD systems change discussion along to help people see that often a little bit of support in community goes a long way. Getting out of the all or nothing paradigm of the dependence upon Medicaid that has been fostered in our community. At the same time, this is not to diminish the need of individuals who have significant and tremendous levels of direct and, resor direct and resource intensive support needs have those needs met. And equally as important, we must make sure that the self-determination vision of individuals with disabilities supported by family caregivers always comes first, even when it's hard for the parents, especially as we talk about family supporting adults over the course of the lifespan. The irony in this conversation may lie in some of our greatest public policy successes. For example, under IDEA, we have legal process protections, but we still cannot achieve consistent, meaningful inclusion and academic success for students with disabilities across this country. We contribute to the inherent conflict by focusing on separate services and systems at the cost of real and equal participation in the rest of the community. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy. And the silos we create make it too easy for everyone else to assume that the disability system is taking care of people with disabilities, which minimizes the shared responsibility that an interdependent society depends upon. How do we reconcile our value system with our practice? We need the specialists, but we don't need the special places. In the classroom, the students need the pedagogy and access to the content. At the doctor's office, People with disabilities need both the neurosurgeon and the primary care physician to provide their care. And at work, employees may need accommodations, but people with intellectual and developmental disabilities can be productive and achieve the workplace goals and should be paid a living wage to do so. We all need healthy reciprocal relationships in our lives with our fr friends, family, neighbors, and colleagues. We must help people with disabilities and family members remember the importance of these relationships and contributions, reciprocity, and social capital in community. It is as important as keeping up to date on the latest research, regulations, and best practices. The DD Act tells us that disability is a natural part of the human experience that does not diminish the right of individuals with developmental disabilities to live independently, to exert control and choice over their own lives, and to fully participate and contribute to their communities through full integration and inclusion in all aspects of society. In order to truly achieve the, this vision, we need to not focus only on disability-specific policy, but also on the, the relationship to mainstream policy and interdependent community relationships. We need to walk our talk regarding inclusion and expend as much energy on working to use our decades of developed disability specific knowledge, research, practice, and policy to inform and improve the greater community instead of building our own world of specialized supports and services. 
It is not the easy path, but it is the right journey towards inclusive, integrated, reciprocal, and beloved communities. As Dr. King said, and I quote, our goal is to create a beloved community, and this will require a qualitative change in our souls, as well as a quantitative change in our lives. Thank you. helping us so eloquently think about what beloved communities really mean. Um, we probably have time for one or two questions and then the conversation will continue outside in a brief reception. We ask you to go to the uh, microphone because we are taping this. Hi Dina, good to see you too. I was happy that you said something about technology. Um, when I look at the skill sets that my son with a developmental disability is lacking, why he can't go to a regular community college, it isn't his intellectual limitations, it's his inability to access the curriculum in an alternative way. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I would like to know what ADD is doing. We heard quite a bit today about people with intellectual disabilities. I'm afraid that in my community and the work I do, I'm working with a population where the bias is the idea that if you need less, you don't have any need, or you're not working hard enough, or mm -hmm. um, you know, you're complaining instead of being productive. And um, as we talked about in Detroit, there's such a void here uh, for the students who may be able to pry their way through that high school diploma, but they certainly can't function independently at community college. That doesn't mean they can't go to college, right. it just means that there's this massive gap here. Mm -hmm. What is ADD and, and the Obama administration doing to help to fill that void for students who certainly have cognitive impairments, but not intellectual disabilities? Um, well, nothing like starting with an easy question. <laughs> um, I have a reputation for that. Well, as, as you may know, um, the Administration on Developmental Disabilities definition of disability is set in statute. It's not something that we control. As you also may know, um, the DD Act is also very explicit in um, encouraging the network to work beyond that set of constraints. And at, while at the core, the intent is to serve people with intellectual and developmental disabilities that, that meet that federal statute, um, the Act is also very clear that is, there is nothing that prohibits the DD Act networks to move beyond that. And many, many of our entities, I can't speak specifically to what's happening here in Tennessee, and if any of you want to jump in, you're, you're welcome to, but I know that the DD Act networks um, in many states are responsible for cross-disability efforts, including education efforts around, in particular, um, students with autism who do not have an intellectual disability, um, who struggle with many of the same needs, but because of eligibility challenges are unable to access the services and supports that they need. I'm the first one to tell you I think it's a crime. I mean, I think that many of these federal definitions of disability, um, I think at last count, um, uh, GEO had done a, a, a study, I mean, we're well over 100 definitions of disability in federal policy. Um, and as you also know, the politics and the resources drive a lot of that out of Congress, not in the executive branch. In terms of what ADD is specifically doing, we don't have jurisdiction over education. Um, the Department of Education does. Um, as you may know, um, the uh, Department of Ed, because of the Higher Education Opportunity Act, I'm going to step into my old role for a second. Um, when I worked on Chairman Miller's staff, one of the other things that we did in the Higher Education Opportunity Act, and I would strongly encourage you to check in with the Department of Ed on this, was to put several provisions in HEOA to um, ensure post-secondary 
students access to materials, technology, and information in accessible formats. And there is actually a commission that's been formed, I don't know if you're aware of this, that's been meeting, they've, I think they've been together for maybe six months or so, it's a, it's a um, FACA committee that's looking at these issues, um, both for students with um, print disabilities in the traditional visual impairment sense, but then also for students with, um, and I apologize for the term, it's what's in the statute, organic brain dysfunction that affects their ability to use traditional materials. Um, and that commission is looking at the intersection of what happens in post-secondary ed around these issues. And so I'd really encourage you to engage in the process um, and check in with the Department of Ed. More broadly, like um, the rehabilitation services, we run into the same the Department of ed. a gentleman into them last week. He has an IQ of 138. They want to put him immediately in job tasks rather than evaluate what he'd be suited for, you know, uh, because he's articulate. Uh, they don't understand the difference in articulate intelligence right. versus functionality. And that's where we fall down. I, you know, so. I would agree. And I think um, VR is long overdue for, it's one of those we were discussing earlier today, the pile of reauthorizations. And, and I would put, you know, VR pretty high on that list. Um, having last been reauthorized in 1998, um, it is way overdue. And um, those definitions around what is a significant disability and how are we um, prioritizing VR resources is at the heart of the debate. I want to thank you once sure. again, Sharon, for being here today. Oh, and there are, I'm sure that many of you have additional questions or comments. We have a lovely reception I'm out in the lobby. We invite you to uh, have a drink and talk to Sharon some more. But in the meantime, I also I don't think I'm going to get this. Where is it? It's right there. Oh, yeah. right here. We would like to present you with this Aww. lovely gift. Oh, it's the yes. picture. It is the picture. <laughs> That's um, awesome. And to thank you for taking the time oh. this, this afternoon and today to be here. And it says, with appreciation to Sharon Lewis, Commissioner of Administration and Developmental Disabilities. Um, this is an, a wonderful collage. It's a miniature of that one. Um, that was produced during a um, Hispanic outreach family event in the park. And the, the depiction and the collage is really what being in community means to those families. So it's very fitting that we kind of close our session this well, afternoon talking about that community and the symbol of what it meant for them. So That's thank lovely. you so much for thank being you here. So much. Thank you. Thank you.